Um, so I'm Bridget Donahue. I'm the director of real estate for the Mille Lacs Band. I'm also on the board of directors for the National Tribal Land Association. So thank you for coming to our ninth annual Tribal Land Staff National Conference. And I am here to introduce Judy Kurtzman. And she's going to presenting on NEPA as a planning tool. So Judy graduated from Utah State University with a master's degree in forest resources and environmental law, along with a graduate certificate in natural resource and environmental policy. She received her undergraduate degree from the University of Minnesota with a dual major of sociology and anthropology. Her teaching experience has included teaching courses on the Utah State University campus, both on NEPA for undergraduate and graduate level students, and an introduction to environmental law and policy course for graduate students. For the last 10 years, she has also taught courses that apply to Utah State University's NEPA certificate program for the Shipley Group as a private consultant. Currently, she's working full-time teaching for Shipley Group Incorporated. Courses taught include applying the NEPA process and writing effective NEPA documents, clear writing for NEPA specialists, science communication and technical writing, cumulative impact analysis and documentation, climate change analysis and documentation, cultural and natural resource management, ESA and Section 7 overview, managing NEPA projects and teams, and reviewing NEPA documents. I'll turn it over to Judy. Welcome to all of you. I'm glad you're here. Some of the faces I see familiar and some are new. So, um, can I ask, um, some of you I know don't know a whole lot about NEPA, but of the new people, um, how many of you are pretty familiar with NEPA? Now, Judy, you're pretty familiar with NEPA, so, yeah. <laughs> hey, you have an attitude we need to talk about. <laughs> How many of you feel like you know that you're pretty comfortable with it, that are new here? Oh, good, good, okay. Okay, well, because the reason I ask, I'm not good at standing at a podium, just doesn't fit, fit my t style, but um, the reason I ask that is that this particular class, I'm not, I mean, I'm talking about NEPA, but I'm not going into the law as much as I'm going into how you use NEPA as a process for planning out actions in a way that allows you to get a clear understanding of what you're doing, why you're doing it, what you hope to achieve by doing it, and what the potential impacts are. So it's a similar process um, that you would use if you were gonna go buy a car. You know, where you start doing some research, you start thinking about what do I want in a car, so I need a new car. That's, my old car is dying, current condition, desired condition, I want a reliable car that I can trust, and so what do I do to make that happen? And looking at Alter, you know, looking at what you want in a car and then looking at the various alternatives you have and then looking at the impacts. How much mileage does this get? What is the cost of this? What, you know, the reliability of it? So the NEPA process is that same process that you would use in planning out the, the solutions for any problem that you have. But people don't always use it that way. So, I cannot confine myself to that one area. I just cannot. So, <clears throat> the primary functions of NEPA include slowing the process, slowing the process down. A lot of people complain about NEPA because they say it delays actions and it costs too much. Well, lo and behold, one of the reasons they passed NEPA was to slow federal agencies' actions down long enough for them to figure out what they should be doing with that. So it was meant to slow things down. It was meant to ensure that before we leaped into something, we understood what we were doing and why we were doing it 
and what the consequences would be of it. So I don't accept that as a complaint about NEPA because it's, it, that's a good part of NEPA. Now, it can get slowed down too far. <laughs> Having worked in academia, um, it, well, it, my husband and I, this is how we work. Um, he will take three years to figure out what kind of new refrigerator we should buy. And we need one now. And I will just impulsively go out and buy a new refrigerator because I like how it looks and it's the right color. <laughs> we make a great team because one takes the time to do the research necessary and the other one says, that's enough research, let's make a decision. So there comes a time when we have enough research, it's ready to make it, we're ready to make a decision on it. And, and so there's that line between too much analysis under NEPA and not enough. Whoops. Um, so looking before you leap, um, spending some time thinking about solutions not getting stuck thinking we've got the answers before we really understand what the problem is and putting some band-aids over a broken leg instead of fixing the broken leg. Understanding what the consequences are of those actions and why, what's beneficial, what's adverse, how do they measure up against each other, and then how can we proceed with something where there are adverse environmental impacts with the least amount of impact possible. One of the things that people get hung up on with NEPA is they start seeing it as a permitting process. Oh, it's this hoop we have to jump through before we can do what we wanna do. It's not a permitting process. It is meant to be a planning process. NEPA doesn't stop anybody from doing anything. Other laws do, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, ESA, they will stop you. NEPA does not stop you as long as you follow the process and do it the way it's supposed to be done and you take a hard look at what are the environmental consequences and what alternatives are out there. So, so um, it should not be treated as a permitting process or a hoop to jump through. It should be treated as a planning process that allows federal agencies to, to really take a look at what they're doing and make sure they're doing it right. We have enough Superfund sites to last for eons of generations. We don't need any more of those. Have any of you heard of the Pike Syndrome? We're in Minnesota, so I thought maybe you guys I'd never heard of it before either, and I'm from Minnesota. So um, the pike syndrome is that if you put a northern pike into an aquarium and then you put a bunch of minnows in a jar and you seal the jar up and you drop it into the aquarium, the pike will strike the jar over and over and over and over again until it gets it in its head that it can't get to those minnows. Those minnows are inaccessible to it, so it stops. Once it stops striking the jar, you can let the minnows free, and it will not eat them. It will starve to death, and it, and it won't eat them, because it has conditioned itself to believe that they are unaccessible, and therefore it doesn't think outside the box ever, couldn't get to them, so they're not accessible, so it sticks with that strategy. Too many federal agencies have fallen into the Pike Syndrome. This is the way we do it. This is how we've always done it. You have no idea how many times I have heard, oh, Judy, we can't do it that way. We've never done it that way. We can only do it this way. We've always done it that way. And I say, well, there's a reason they asked me to come and do some training here. And it's to help you guys think outside the box. So you guys need to help them think outside the box and give them ideas and help them realize, because a lot of them do not. They see NEPA as a hurdle they have to jump through instead of as a process that can help them really understand the best way to approach a problem. 
So goals of NEPA are to influence the decision-making process. And by influencing the decision-making process, the goal of NEPA was to ensure the environment was considered in that decision-making process and that agencies considered ways to reduce their impacts. So um, the only way to have it truly be a good way to solve a problem is to ensure that we understand what the problem is. I mentioned earlier, for those of you who are here earlier, it's not a process, I mean, understanding the problem should not be done by one person. It needs a team of people looking at it from different perspectives, from both inside the agency and outside the agency. And for the tribes, you guys are the public for those federal agencies. You guys are the ones who need to get involved. You know your land so much better than they do. So you know that when they think that, um, I was just talking to a couple this morning, and it was the perfect example of they, so um, they had a copper mine and the copper mine was cleaned up, right? So they cleaned up, the, they cleaned up the copper mine. This is the copper mine. But they didn't look at anything around the copper mine. And there happens to be a stream that goes right here. And we all know that pollution doesn't have a tendency to just sit quietly in one place. It has a tendency to dis, you know, to seep its way out into things. And they go down to a river stream there and they collect reeds for basket weaving and the women apparently they pull the weeds out the reeds out by the roots and then they run them through their teeth now you got copper pollution in that it's been soaked up by the roots as well as being in the water what is that doing to the health of the women in that tribe who are doing that and they never check, you know, they're, they're checking the water quality now, but they weren't. So it's one of those things where, you know, we think that, you know, there's problems with, the, with water quality, but where is it all coming from? And that's a place nobody was looking at, that it might have been seeping in from the copper mine because nobody cleaned up beyond the borders of it. So making sure we identify what, is the big picture problem and we address all of it instead of putting a band-aid here and there and never really solving it. And we and then looking once we've got the problem, looking at the solutions. And again, you need more than one mind. <laughs> I I know I know some of you work with the Army Corps of Engineers. <laughs> You're okay, and don't get me wrong. I've I've good friends who are engineers, okay? But Engineers are pretty narrow visioned. They solve a problem, we've come up with the solution, this is the solution, here's how we're gonna do it. And then I say to them, well, you, you can't just come up with that solution because we don't know, there could be, there could be, a, there could be a wetland, a unique wetland, right, where you put this. So we, you can't, you can't come up with solutions until we've had a chance to go out and look at the environment and see what are all the things so we can come up with numerous solutions to solving that problem. And, and it requires a lot of minds. It requires people with different backgrounds, people with different priorities, people with different expertise. So both the problem and the solutions need what's called an interdisciplinary team approach. And it's required under NEPA, under Section 1022A, it is required that an interdisciplinary team with the people who have appropriate disciplines are, are coming up with, the, with identifying the problem and the solutions. And that then allows us to see the big picture look. Keep forgetting I have one. So just 
to, to support my conclusions here, NEPA was always meant to be a planning process. So even in the act itself, you know, like I said, it says it'll utilize an interdisciplinary approach which will ensure the integrated use of natural and social sciences and environmental design arts in planning and in decision making, integrate the requirements of NEPA with other planning and environmental review procedures, integrate the NEPA process early in planning. So one of the reasons NEPA serves as a good planning um, process is because before you get started too far into it, you know what other laws are going to come into play. So if you know you need, if, for example, um, a Section 404 permit is needed, regardless of who it's needed by, who's ever doing this knows they better start that permitting process. If we know that um, maybe there's an endangered species, and I know that the ESA doesn't apply on tribal lands, but you're usually still working with Fish and Wildlife Service and the state to try and preserve endangered species in their habitat. So you'll probably still want to consult with them and, and get their expertise. Um, if there is an air quality permit needed, get, you know, that's what the beauty of NEPA is, is it's making you look at that big picture and it's making you recognize what are, what are the other things that we're going to need to get taken care of in this process that we better start right at the beginning. I always hear this. Oh, that's right, we have to do NEPA. Well, there's another delay. And no, we're, we're not a delay. The environmental people, we are not a delay. You should have had us involved right at the beginning, and then we wouldn't be delaying anything. It's a law, and the federal agencies have to comply with it, and it's a good law because it makes them think about things they wouldn't otherwise think about, like the environment. So um, it was always meant to be something that was part of the planning process and that would assist federal agencies in identifying the big picture so they could see what other, what other parts of their actions were going to require environmental permits or um, uh, and not necessarily environmental, uh, not, I mean, environmental permits as well as other laws that they, that are part of their mandate. Um, so planning, for those of you who might not know the definition, uh, it's a rational and deliberate process that helps make informed decision in solving problems that have been identified. It's also step-by-step -step process. So it's, uh, and, and I'm gonna show you a process that it's a six-step process that has been applied to NEPA um, on how you address the problems, the symptoms, and the solutions. And again, planning should never, it's not a single person process. Planning should be done by a group of people that have a number of different talents, a number of different areas of knowledge that can come together and see the bigger picture better as a group than they can as individuals. So planning also requires flexibility. If you go into this process or you are working with somebody who goes into this process and they've got everything already predetermined before they even come to the tribe, that's a problem. Because what, how is the tribe going to help them then? They, they have to be flexible and open-minded and the tribe has to be flexible and open-minded. And the people within that, it's part of what makes planning good, is that if you keep your mind open, you keep it flexible, you can come up with the best ideas. Whenever things become too narrow and too rigid, you're gonna miss out on opportunities. And I'm not gonna say that, that, that's, that there aren't certain actions you can take 
where there might be only one way to approach this problem and, and you don't need to spend a whole lot of time thinking about it and putting effort into it because there are those situations. And I see, you know, 80 to 90% of all actions are categorically excluded. So we're talking about 10 to 20% of the actions where we're, we're putting this process into place. And even sometimes with this process, it might be that there's only one solution to a problem. But let's look at it before we make that determination. So it requires flexibility and it allows for identification of what could be some of those other problems. So you get those surveys done for cultural resources. You get those surveys done for what are the, what are the species, what kind of habitat is out there. What are potential what, where's, where are the wetlands? Where are the streams? Where are the lakes? And how, how are they in comparison to where we're looking at and what are we going to do to them? So getting a good idea of, of what's out there before we start things and destroy it for those, that irreversible or irretrievable impacts, avoiding those if we can by understanding what's there first. And again, if working in a team can be a true pain in the rear, and I, I recognize that, but um, it's an absolute necessity at, in this, in, with the complexity involved in ecosystems and people, it needs a team approach because not one person is gonna understand an ecosystem. And I don't know, do any of us understand people? I'm not sure, but you need to have that, you need to have that variety of people looking at things. Um, and then within that, as a team member, a willingness to listen, a willingness to open your mind to new ideas and new thoughts. Um, A willingness to recognize uh, that um, it doesn't matter what the age, gender, uh, even expertise is of people, that everybody has something to contribute. If, if, the, if they're there at the table, they must have something to contribute that's important. So taking the time to listen and to care about what other people have to say is a really important part, part of this process. So these are the six steps that I want to introduce you to. And then, and I'm going to kind of go through them as fast as I can because I'm going to put you into teams and I'm going to have you do a little planning process using NEPA as your concept for doing it. So let's start with identifying your purpose and need, which is identifying your problem, okay? So in identifying your problem, you're going to start with who's planning to do what, where, and when. So it might be that the tribe is planning to what? What might be something you guys might plan to do? Okay, develop a cultural center. That's a great... That's a great example. What might the BIA plan to do on, on one of your tribal lands? Put a new road in? No. <laughs> okay, I do know they do that, but okay. <laughs> Well, they do permit oil and gas drilling. Not on your reservation. <laughs> okay. So you don't work much with BIA then? No. Okay. How about those of you who do? Do any of you do oil and gas drilling? No, we don't do that in Minnesota, really. Boy, if I, were, if I was out west, like 90% of you would. And uh, by west, I mean North Dakota and... <laughs> beyond. 
Uh, what federal agency do you work with? Oh. I won't tell him you said that, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, grant easements. Yep, they can grant right of ways. They can also put fee lands into trust lands. Um, so, I did, so, did I do it again? Identifying who's doing what and where and when and then defining that what in terms that allow for a broad array of solutions. If you make that what so narrow that there's only one way to approach it, then you're not gonna look outside the box. If you broaden the what somewhat, then you can start looking at different ways you might wanna approach it. What is the problem? And why is it a problem? So how, what's the current condition versus the desired condition? And then describing what you hope to achieve. So one example, um, tribe in Arizona. They're in, the, uh, they're in the higher elevation, so they get snow in the winter. And they put in a new housing development but they didn't put an access, uh, they, there was a, just a dirt access road to it from the, from the main road. And so the BIA decided, and so in the winter and spring it was not passable. They'd have to park on the highway and it was about a half a mile to three quarters of a mile walk into the housing development. So the BIA thought, oh well we should put a new road in there for them, and which is not unusual, the BIA came to the tribe and said, we want to put a new road in here and we want to put it right here, from here to here. And the tribe said, no thank you, we don't want your road. And it happened to be one of my students who was working for the BIA. And he said, I just could not understand why they wouldn't want a road. I mean, there were older people, there were people with children, and they're in the winter, they're walking three quarters of a mile you know, through the snow to get to their house. And so he went back three times. Now he wasn't a member of that tribe. So they didn't particularly trust him. He went back three times. And in the third time, they said to him, we don't want your road because where you have chosen to put that road, there's two trees. And then in the summer and fall, that's where the women in our tribe go to after, after dinner at night to socialize and to weave baskets and to, you know, that, that's their place. And it's been like that for 200 years and you would have to cut those trees down and the women said no. And so he said, well, what if we put the road over here? And he, they said, okay, yeah, then we want the road. So sometimes, you know, that's why you don't want to be so rigid in your solutions to the problem. They identified the problem pretty well, you know. The desired condition is they could get in there year round and not have to walk through it. Um, but they didn't look at solutions until it was brought to their attention. So making sure that, you know, you're discussing what are the issues, what are the potentials, and taking that broader look. So it also includes um, the, you know, looking at the problem that's broken or missing and then opportunities to basically repair it and compare that to the current condition and how much, how well are you solving the problem? So you have to be able to finish the sentence the problem is so that it's clear and concise and the people in the room all agree, yep, we all agree that that is the problem. And then we all agree that the, here's what we hope to achieve by doing it. 
and that some of these things are going to be constrained by whatever it is they're going to be constrained by. Whether it's water quality, air quality, wetlands, habitat, um, cultural resources, traditional cultural properties. Um, and then finding solutions that meet both solving the problem and meeting the objectives. So we'll begin this process with identifying what initiated the planning process, who the community members were that identified the need for example, better housing, better schools, um, economic opportunities, or sometimes it can be a phone call from a federal agency proposing something to you guys. And then the constraints within there, address those as well, because this is setting up where the, what is a reasonable solution and you want to include in that the constraints. So if there's wetlands there, which there's a lot of in Minnesota, I know, um, how can we do this and preserve the wetlands? How can we do this and preserve winter habitat? How can we do this and, and, and reduce our, our impacts to air quality? And then comparing those solutions to see which are the best. Step two in this process is to get out there on the ground and know what the current conditions are of the resources, the ecosystem, and the community that's being impacted. So having, and, and I know for many of the tribes, you know, a lot of the tribal members already know that. But the federal agencies you're working with do not. So you're gonna need to convince them that you do have a good understanding of it. And when it comes to NEPA, it can't just be hearsay. There's gotta be scientific evidence backing it up. That means there has to be on the ground, surveying, sampling, running carrying capacity models, those kind of things so that so that there's something that can show we really, we're not, we're not making anything up. We have scientific evidence backing up what the current conditions are and what the trends are for those resources, ecosystems, and communities. So if you have a water quality problem and it's just been getting, you, you have, what data on water quality from 1989. And let's say there were the, the total suspended solids, the sediment and the leaves and the other stuff that goes in there. In 1989, it was seven milligrams per liter. And today it's 17 milligrams per liter. Well, the trend for this resource is it's declining. Water quality is declining, and therefore aquatic wildlife is probably declining too. So how, is that, how are we going to change that? Are we going to improve water quality, or are we going to be adding to the problems it's having? So understanding what's out there, understanding its current condition and the trend, quantifying that information to the best of your ability, and then qualifying it in the sense that we can quantify the effects on water quality by understanding how many parts per million or milligrams per liter or whatever of pollutants are in there. But what does that mean to the people who are using that for fishing, for swimming, for gathering uh, food sources, that's the quality part. How are we affecting the quality of life for the people? And how is this, this contaminated water affecting the quality of life for people? So it's not just looking at 
numbers, but also quality of life. And the next, is, as part of step two, the, it, it's an inventory. So we're, we're completing that inventory by gathering our information, using historic conditions, and then um, filling in the details by either doing more research, literature reviews, talking to elders, talking to other federal, state, local agencies, people who have information on, on those resources that we might be missing. Whoops. That says step one is supposed to be step two. Um, and I mentioned this already. It's got to be scientific. There's got to be some substance to it. It can't just be, well, this is what, this is what we think is going on there. Or we just know this. That's not accepted because this is a legal document. So it needs to be backed up by scientific evidence. Um, and, and you also need to see what other laws, does the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, um, the, uh, uh, well, are there endangered species there? What other laws might we need to be working on the permitting of? Um, And then when I say cost up here, um, I'm not just talking about dollar figures, but I'm talking about impacts to human health and safety. So what are the costs associated with it when it comes to, um, to, uh, to understanding the current condition and who it's affecting? And then forecasting future conditions in both the, looking at the solutions to the problems and looking at what happens if we do nothing. So NEPA requires that you look at the no action alternative. Its purpose is to serve as a baseline condition that helps you understand here's what happens if we do nothing and we just, if we don't, if we don't, if we don't clean up this area and we continue to let the copper, whatever com is coming from the copper mine, go into the river? What happens if we don't, um, if we don't decide to open this area to grazing of cattle? And what happens if we do? So you can do that comparison of sometimes the no action alternative is the best one. Sometimes doing nothing is the best idea. Sometimes you can show by looking at it, doing nothing is far worse than doing something, even something that may have impacts to the ecosystem or the community. Um, one of the things to keep in mind here, though, comes back to that, what is it, the over-analysis, the don't collect more information than you need because you'll be doing that forever then, and you'll never get anything done. And don't waste time collecting information that isn't relevant. Don't waste money collecting time that isn't relevant, uh, information that isn't relevant or meeting your objectives. And don't waste time collecting information on resources, ecosystems, or communities not affected by the action. It's how we've gotten to having NEPA documents that are 1,200 pages because it's filled with useless information. Then we develop our solutions or our alternatives. So before we can develop our solutions and our alternatives, we should have a really good indication of what's going on in the area where we intend to take this action. And then we can come back and start developing our solutions. NEPA, it goes chapter one, purpose and need, chapter two, alternatives, chapter three, current conditions. I'm suggesting you do chapter three before you start trying to do chapter two because it will, it will give you a better idea in looking at alternatives what you can and cannot do. And it will stop those, those engineers from designing things that aren't 
that they're wasting their time designing because they're not feasible for that particular area. Um, explain how each of those solutions is going to meet that purpose and need, solve the problem, meet your objectives, and then, are you all familiar with mitigation measures? Those are, those are the actions that you take that will avoid an adverse impact, reduce an adverse impact, uh, rectify an, an adverse impact, or compensate for it. So figuring out in this, we know that we're going to, uh, we know that we're going to impact deer uh, habitat in this area. So let's set aside this area and for, you know, into a conservation easement or something where we know that that will always be available to them. If we're going to be, have it irreversible, we're going to put housing development over here, which is part of their habitat. We're pushing them out of here. Let's make sure they always have an area to go to. Um, so these we're specifying in this. One of the things that is often a problem is that when people start talking about alternatives, they talk about them in general terms. They give this wide, you know, oh, we're going to build a road. But they don't say how much vegetation, how many acres of vegetation they have to remove in order to build this road. Is it going to be a two-lane road, a four-lane road? Is it going to have is it going to be gravel? Is it going to be pavement? Is it going to have water bars to prevent, uh, to prevent uh, flooding? Is it going to have turnaround areas? All of that kind of detail needs to go into the solutions. There's no way to analyze the impacts if you don't have the details, the real details, of what you're going to do to solve this problem. So m getting those down pat. Um, and and making sure that the solutions you're proposing are in fact meeting your objectives and solving the problem. And then um, looking at, uh, and this is mostly from the federal agency side, and keep in mind this, remember, uh, NEPA only applies to federal actions. And federal actions are actions that, that are done by a federal agency, funded by a federal agency, or permitted by a federal agency. So it doesn't apply if you guys are doing something without any federal nexus. But I still recommend you use NEPA as a planning process. And, and I've been working with a lot of tribes that that's their specific reason for bringing me in is to help them understand how to do NEPA so they can do it for as a planning process. So, um, but looking at the the management features, is it something that is it something that the agency is allowed to do and that involves just management, or is it something that the agency is allowed to do and it involves structure? Because there's a very big difference when you start building things and digging than if you're just managing things. Um, I think I've covered that enough. So I'm going to go on to the next one. Uh, one of the ways to do this, one of the best ways to find solutions, sometimes it's easier not to reinvent the wheel. So looking at checklists, talking to other people who've had the problem, and finding solutions that have worked for other entities uh, rather than wasting your time uh, reinventing the wheel. If somebody's already found a good solution to that problem, use it. Always bring in the people with the expertise needed. Uh, so we, we do need engineers. Um, they do help us in figuring things out. And we also need people from the community, particularly people who've been there for a long time and understand the area well and understand what can and cannot be done. And then, um, using that formal 
method for brain, you know, brainstorming with people, writing things down, doing what I'm gonna have you do here in just a little bit. Uh, next step, analyzing the direct and indirect impacts. Again, this requires you to do, to have scientific methods for how you do this. There is a level of professional guesswork that goes into it, but it's educated guesswork. It's not just haphazard guesswork. So um, analyze and quantify what are the beneficial and adverse impacts associated with it. Remember to look at it from an unquantifiable amenity perspective. In other words, how is it changing the, how are we changing the quality of life for people? And for the most part, it should be you're improving the quality of life for people. But what usually happens? In most scenarios, what happens? You improve the quality of life for some people, and you decrease it for other people. So who are the people benefiting from this, and who are the people who are paying the price for it? And in the big scheme of things, is it a fair? Is it fair what's going on? And are there ways that we can sh both share in the benefits and the not so beneficial results of an action being taken? Um, and the only way you do that is by looking at what are those, what the, the, the values and the quality of life perspectives and then include mitigation measures. So requires employees, partners, or consultants with the appropriate expertise to help you with this, as well as those that you already have. So these are just some examples of the kind of people that are involved in the process. And, uh, I'm hitting the wrong one, sorry guys. Um, and then evaluating the solutions that you came up with by knowing what the impacts are, beneficial and adverse. So looking at each of them differently and comparing them. And then, and that includes the no action and quantifying those differences so that it's very clear for the people looking at it how things change as far as air quality goes or water quality goes or level of good habitat goes. And um, also evaluating it for what's the magnitude of the effects. In other words, how much is being affected? How big is the change? Where's the location? What's the timing? of the action and how long is the duration of the impacts? Are we looking at 50 years of impacts or are we looking at three months of impacts? And then an appraisal of them, do the benefits outweigh the adverse? Um, and then the fourth evaluation is a pass-fail test for each of the alternatives. Are, is it worth it or should we just dismiss it? Because one thing you don't want to have to do is, is present 15 alternatives. It's too many. Even seven is really too many. You want to narrow the alternatives down to the ones that best meet that purpose and need and have the least amount of damage. To me, that's usually four or five of them that you can realistically really analyze in depth. Um, so some common criteria in this evaluation of pass or fail is, does the alternative meet um, uh, the purpose and does it solve the problem? How well does it do that? Does the alternative um, overcome those, you know, those constraints like, uh, putting 
too much sediment or too much of a chemical into the water because you're using an herbicide. Um, efficiency, is it within your budget? Can you afford to do it? And then the last one, is it legal and is it acceptable to the tribal members? So um, this last one, or the, I'm sorry, we have one more step. Uh, this uh, alternatives, so this is what NEPA says about alternatives. So this comes out of the CEQ regulation. So for those of you that I, were here this morning, this is one of the regulations you should read because it tells you how to do alternatives. This section is the heart of the environmental impact statement. Based on the information and the analyses presented in the sections on affected environment and the environmental consequences, it should present the environmental impacts of the proposal and the alternative in, compar in comparative form, thus sharply defining the issues and providing a clear basis for choice among options by the decision maker and the public. So in the CEQ regulations, they want you to, the people reading the document, to be able to clearly understand what those differences are. And that's usually done with a table that literally puts, you know, the here's the resources affected, here's what the current condition is, here's what happens when you we don't do anything, and here's how we change it through the alternatives. And one of the things you don't see a lot is the cost-benefit analysis, which if I were a tribal member, I'd want to know what's the difference in the cost between the alternatives. Um, you rarely see that in any of them, and I'm not sure why. If we're looking at, um, do any, none of you guys have oil and gas drilling, huh? How about mining? Oh, you guys are really lucky. How come all the tribes I work with have so many problems like that? Um, well, we're not in Arizona, Nevada, Utah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, the, a cost-benefit analysis, though, includes not just the different costs between the actual solutions, but the cost of, you know, building in floodplains, the cost of how many people get sick because you have a coal-burning facility um, on the reservation. And then, you know, one of the things that agencies will do a lot with is, well, look at how many jobs we're creating. We're creating, you know, all these jobs, and they'll use, they'll do that part of the cost-benefit analysis, but then they don't talk about what the cost of dirty water is, or what the cost of dirty air is, and how that affects health and well-being of people. So there was a recent court case, actually, where the judge said, you can't just give us Benefit, beneficial costs, you have to give us the adverse costs as well. And that's just an example of how you can do that. And the last step is the actual decision making, the selection of the alternatives. Now, if you're working with the BIA and you're doing NEPA with them, the tribe's preferred alternative should be the BIA's preferred alternative, unless there's a really good reason for it not to be. Um, and what the decision maker at the BIA and what the tribal decision makers are looking at is, does it solve the problem? Does it meet, does it bring us the good things we're hoping it will bring us? Um, does it meet our objectives? What's the cost? Is it within our budget? Is it logistically feasible? And are we doing anything illegal with it? Um, I mentioned this already, sometimes not doing anything. This, this process can show that the no action alternative actually is the best alternative because we haven't found a solution that actually is better than doing nothing. Sometimes the analysis reveals that 
if we put this part of this alternative with this part of this alternative with this part of this alternative, it's actually a better alternative. Or sometimes the decision maker, um, and, and we um, will look at, will sometimes weigh the concerns of the community against the information given to them by the experts and a lot of times they'll fall on the side of the experts. Um, I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying oftentimes decisions fall that way. Um, the public involvement process in this is absolutely crucial. And one of the things that I've noticed with the tribes that I've been working with is public involvement is not as sufficient as it should be. That there, we're, we're not getting information out to tribal members and giving them an opportunity to get involved in the way that we should. Part of that is because a lot of times with, depending upon the tribe, it can be that they, you know, they're used to letting the leaders make the decision, they're used to trusting them and not not feeling they need to get involved. But remember, it, even if they don't oppose anything that's being done, sometimes they have good information they can share about what's happening in that particular area. Or, or maybe they, you know, maybe they're, you know, they just finished getting a degree in something and they have better information on methods of analysis than somebody who's been doing it for 40 years and is kind of out of the loop. So we need to get people involved. We need to understand that people who care probably have something relevant and important to contribute. Um, and this is basically just saying that, making sure that you, you look, don't reinvent the wheel, go back, uh, look at other environmental documents, look at comments, look at, look at responses to comments, look at what, you know, what is your public saying? What are the other federal agencies saying? Sometimes there's community concerns because it could affect them. What are they saying? The decision maker has to take all of that into consideration and it has to be in there. Uh, in, with NEPA, you've got two decision documents. If you do an environmental impact statement, which says you're having a significant impact on some aspect of the, of the natural, physical, social, or economic environment, then you do a record of decision. If you do an environmental assessment and you get through the process and you find out there's no potential for a significant impact to any aspect of the natural, physical, social, or economic environment, then you end with a finding of no significant impact. And again, public involvement is crucial to this process. And it's also required by NEPA. So agencies are required to make a diligent effort to get out there and talk to, talk to people and to ensure that there's enough public notice given to, to um, ensure that the that you know we're not just we're not just putting a completed document into the library in town and thinking that's sufficient that's not public involvement first of all that's informing the public of what we've already decided we're going to do and how many people on the reservation are going to go track down a NEPA document in the local library they're not so making sure it gets information gets put before the whole process begins by putting it in places where people living on the reservation actually see it. Um, honesty uh, has not always been a strong point in the NEPA process. I don't I, I honestly don't understand why federal agencies are so afraid. Well, okay. 
maybe I do. Um, if they're not doing NEPA the way they're supposed to be doing NEPA, then honesty might be, not being honest is a lot easier for them. But, oh, what a tangled web we weave when at first we do deceive. It always comes back to bite you. So there, you need always to make sure, even if it's bad news, make sure they're telling you everything that they need to tell you. Um, because it's really, it's, it sucks to have it after the fact. And now you can't make any comments on it. You can't do anything about it. So it's important that, that the people, the decision makers within the tribe are being honest with the people in the tribe and that the federal agencies are being honest with the decision makers and their contacts within the tribe so they can make sure everybody gets the information. Um, I guess I moved forward again, did I? <laughs> right. I didn't touch that, and it's a different slide up there than what I looked at before. <laughs> These are different ways that you can do public involvement, um, just as, you know, that, that federal agencies within their regulations are things that they're required to do. Um, and these are um, the participants. So we've got federal agencies, and then we've got state governments, local governments, tribes, proponents of an action that can include tribes, special interest groups, concerned citizens, third-party contractors. Now, when it comes to NEPA on tribal lands, the only public, it does not include concerned citizens and special interest groups outside of the tribe. So the tribal members are the only public who have the right to make comments on, um, and the third party contractors, um, federal agencies like the Army Corps of Engineers, they don't have enough people to do the NEPA documents that they're required to do, so they hire contractors to do them. And that can pose a problem because the contractors aren't doing the planning process the way they're supposed to be doing it. Okay, I've already said that. And I think I, so the, the uh, federal agency's NEPA documents can be, uh, the uh, tribal members can sue the federal agency for non-compliance with NEPA, which is what the Sioux in South Dakota did. Um, and they, they actually won, and the Army Corps of Engineers had to go back and redo, but the damage was already done, frankly, by the time that happened, so. Okay. Good, so we have 20 minutes to do this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to ask you, think right now for a moment of something, a project that's being done or is being proposed or already has been done. And what I want you to do, I'm giving you a thing for the planning process. This is a template that you can use for planning, okay? I'm going to break you into groups. So I'm going to have you guys be one group, okay? Holly, that's you. And I'm going to have, I figured this way you can move around easier. So I'm going to have you guys be a group, okay? And I'm going to have um, you, you six be a group, okay? And then, oh, actually, do you mind turning around being part of that one? Okay. So you five be a group and you six be a group. And then you're going to have to move over a little bit, but... How about, um, Judy, do you mind, or actually, you two going back? Yeah, and then you four? Is that good? You got shorted a person, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going to hand these out, so I'm going to put this down. Oh, you got it. 
I'm going to walk around group to group and help you out. And you have about 20 minutes to work on this. What I want you to do is just get a general idea of what goes into this planning process using NEPA, how you can start this planning process. I think there's enough there for everybody, 